Yay, more limit problems with integrals. Yeah, this is a bummer. This is the other type of improper integral. Now these are harder to spot, and that's kind of the worst thing about them. They're somewhat easier to do because there's no infinities involved. The problem is that this is improper for a very subtle reason. If you integrate this thing, when you go to plug in, or actually if you plug those numbers in the original function, which is not something you usually do, usually when you take definite integrals, you wait until after you've integrated to plug in your limits of integration, right? But the problem here is that if you took a second and actually tried plugging in zero to the original function, the thing you're integrating, you're going to get undefined. You're going to get infinity. So, if, And we can see why that is pretty easily. This thing has an asymptote at zero. So, And just to remind you, the general shape of something like 1 over x squared, it's got an asymptote at zero, so it pretty much just shoots up to infinity at the y-axis. And same thing coming from the left. So when we take the integral from 0 to 1, what we're taking is we're trying to find this area. But how do you find the area of something that's infinitely tall? And you take the area of a rectangle or a triangle. There's always a height, right? But what happens when that thing just shoots off into infinity and there's no height? Well, that's what we're about to find out. It turns out that's not legal because technically the definition of integrals and stuff like that the thing they always say first is if the function is continuous and exists on the interval and all that kind of stuff. But this function doesn't technically exist on the interval from 0 to 1. It exists on the interval from curved parentheses 0 to 1, but not square bracket 0 to 1, which it would have to for the limit for the uh, integral to exist. So as with the previous batch of these improper integrals, we're going to take a limit. We're just going to replace the offending number with a letter and then take the limit as that letter approaches zero. You can see that this one's a similar kind of story. If you plug in eight, you'll get a zero downstairs. No good. So again, we have a very mathy type of problem where plugging in would have worked just fine, but hey. So if you look at this one, zero is the problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch this to a limit and I'll just replace that, um, that number with an A. So we'll take a, as a approaches 0, and technically it's from the right because this little interval from 0 to 1 is sort of to the right side of 0. But nonetheless, we're just integrating from a to 1. And might as well rewrite this as x to the minus 2 dx. All right, so at this point, we've got the limit. As a approaches 0 from the right, the integral of x to the minus 2 is x to the minus 1 over negative 1. And that is from a to 1. All right, so we got the limit as a approaches 0 from the right of plug in 1, and you just get negative 1. So we plug in 1 for x, we get um, negative 1 over x. I kind of skipped a step, actually. This is 1 over x. This limit as a approaches 0 of negative 1 over 1 minus negative 1 over a. And of course those negatives cancel. All right, so at this point we're going to go ahead and plug in. So we get negative 1 plus 1 over a, but then when you take the limit of 1 over a as a approaches 0, that's undefined, it's no limit, it's infinity, however you want to write it. The point is this does not exist. This limit does not exist, and therefore this problem, the area between 0 and 1, diverges. So they're not really saying, hey, the area is infinite, nor are they saying that the area um, doesn't exist. It's just the area diverges. So just like in the other improper integral problems, when the limit doesn't exist, it's diverging. All right, so let's take a look at one with a slightly different problem, and that is that the 8 is actually the limit that's going to offend here. Because even though we have stuff downstairs, the 0, no big deal, because 8 minus 0 is 8. So this thing exists fine. Um, at the lower limit, it's the 8 that's the problem. So in this one, we're going to have to take the limit as b approaches 8. And the reason I, and it, technically we're approaching from the left, but it turns out that little minus doesn't really matter because either we're going to get a number when we plug in 8 or we're going to get nothing and it diverges. The only time you really have to worry about these pluses and minuses is back when you're in the limit section at the beginning of calculus. This minus could mean the difference between a, a limit of negative infinity or positive infinity. But we don't care about that. If we get infinity anything, either plus or minus infinity, we're just going to write down diverges, and it won't matter. Or when we plug in 8, we'll get a number, in which case the little negative didn't matter either. 
So that's why I'm just going to pretty much ignore the little minuses next to there. Um, and then I'm going to call it B instead of A, like we did in the last problem, because the upper bound, the one that's having the trouble, is the upper bound. So I'll just call that B. But it really doesn't matter um, what you do there. All right, so from, neg from 0 to B. And I'm just going to rewrite this as a negative power to make it easier to integrate. So it's going to be 8 minus x to the negative 1 third dx. All right, so this is actually kind of subtle, but we need a, we actually have a chain rule problem or a u sub problem because we, we're 8 minus x is the thing being raised to the negative 1 third power, which means our du is negative dx. So that means I need a negative sign in here in front of the dx, which means I have to put a negative out front to make up for it. So we got the limit as b approaches 8 of negative. And now it starts getting tricky. So 8, to mi uh, eight minus x to the positive 2 thirds. Because negative 1 third plus 1 is 2 thirds. But then I have to divide by, three, by 2 thirds. And of course, that goes from 0 to b. So easy for there's so many little nitpicky things in here that it's easy to leave them off. So this equals limit as b approaches eight of negative dividing by two thirds is the same thing as multiplying by three halves. So eight minus x. And you know what? Let's just go ahead and plug in our limits. Well, no, I'm gonna do it step by step because I make less mistakes that way, and I'll show you kind of how to not make mistakes too. So limit as b approaches eight. The temptation is to do stuff in your head to, to speed things up. What happens a lot is you end up making mistakes that way. And a lot of times it actually, not only do you get the answer wrong, but you end up wasting more time anyway because you'll get near the end of the problem and realize, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. And you spend more time tracking down the, pro the error you made than you would have just doing it fully the first time. All right, so we got negative 3 halves. Now I'm going to plug in my limits. So 8 minus b. <laughs> Um, oh, there's a, God, it's so easy to forget something. So two-thirds. So I'm going to get eight minus b to two-thirds minus, and then plug in my lower limit, eight minus zero to two-thirds. All right, negative three-halves times all that stuff. So that's going to be, now at this point, I'm actually going to plug in eight for b. You know, that's how limit problems go. We ultimately do is just plug in the number instead of the letter. So I've got negative 3 halves times 8 minus 8 is 0 to the 2 thirds, and then 8 to the 2 thirds. All right, so that's just 0. So I've got negative 3 halves times 8 to the 2 thirds. And that's actually negative 8 to the 2 thirds. So easy to forget stuff on here. So what is eight to the what is eight to the two thirds? Oh, by the way, this is negative eight. Oh, that's eight to the two thirds, yeah. So negatives cancel. So what is eight to the two thirds? All right, so we got a three halves. Then eight to the two thirds is eight squared, and then cube rooted. Or doesn't really matter. So we get three halves. And then 8 squared is 64, cube root of 64 is 4. So the cube root of 8 squared is 4. 12 halves, which equals 6. All right, now that problem is a computational nightmare. I got the answer I expected to get because I worked out this problem ahead of time, obviously. So uh, it was successful, but you can see how many chances there are to make a mistake. I left out the power one time. That was a close call, or maybe this one right here I kind of left out. It's just like you're writing down so many little nitpicking things with each step that it's really hard to get through these in one piece and actually get the fully right answer. So just be as careful as you can, but realize there's only going to be one of these on the test, two tops. So it's not like you're going to get an F if you mess up the busy work. The really key thing is to do enough practice that you can go through the steps you know, so that you'll be able to finish the test because that's the most important thing. On these really nitpicky hard problems, the really important thing is finishing the test. So do a bunch of practice. Check your answers in the back of the book and just realize, if you're like me, I'm pretty good at math, but I still get a lot wrong due to the, uh, just the tedious algebra on these things. All right, so here, the, what's the problem with this one? Tangent of 0 is fine, but tangent of pi over 2 is undefined. 
So that's why we've, it's an improper integral. And it's also a hard integral, so let's take a look. Limit, this is our upper integral, it's a problem, so b approaches pi over 2. Now this one's hard enough that you probably wouldn't have to do one with these tangents in it and stuff unless you're in a pretty hard class. So you've got that going for you. 0 to b of tan x. What the heck is the integral of tangent of x? Yeah, it's not one of the ones you know, and that's because it doesn't come up. It's not, it's not a good one. It's not one of the easy ones. It's, it's pretty complicated. So what we're going to have to do is, uh, I'll work it off to the side. Basically, the integral of tan, because I don't want to have to write the limit as b approaches pi over 2 a million times. Um, I guess I could with that. All right. I apologize. b minus pi over 2, 0, b. So what we're going to have to do is split up tan x into sine over cosine. And the reason for that is simple. There was no way to integrate tan x as is. Because if you wanted to do a power rule, like consider it tan tangent, integrate it to tangent squared, you would need the derivative of tangent to be part of your du. But you obviously don't have a secant squared in this puppy. But what, the trick we're going to use is if we turn it into this thing, a fraction like this, then our u is going to be cosine x, which means our du is negative sine x. And look at that. That's what we got right up here. So by making the, co the denominator our u, magically our du works out fine. We just need a negative sign. So we need a negative in front of the sign because we have a negative sign right here, which means we have to put a negative out front as well to compensate. So we end up with the negative. I still don't need that equal yet. Limit as b approaches pi over 2 of the negative integral from 0 to b of cosine to negative 1 x times negative sine x dx. All right, so since our u equals cosine x, du equals negative sine x, that leaves us with the limit. Now, I'm not going to do u sub just because it's really annoying, but the point is integral of cosine um, to the negative 1. Actually, I should have. That negative 1 can be confusing. Made it look like an inverse cosine. Really, I just mean 1 over cosine. So this is actually going to integrate to the negative ln of cosine. So we got the limit as b approaches in, uh, pi over 2 of the negative. Then the integral of 1 over cosine, integral of 1 over u, is the ln of u. So it's the ln of cosine x. And of course, that negative sine x dx is part of our du, so it just goes away. And this is integral uh, integrated from 0 to pi over 2. All right, so we got the limit as b approaches pi over 2. Negative. I just put the negative out front so I don't get confused. So I got the natural log of, now what's the cosine of pi over 2? Oops, that should have been a b. All right, so ln of b minus, ah, that's a cosine of b, cosine b, minus the natural log of cosine of plugging the lower limit, which is 0. All right, so that's, so at this point, I'm just taking the limit of all this stuff. So now I'm going to finally replace all my b's with pi over 2's. So what's the natural? So we got the ln of, what's the cosine of pi over 2? So I just plug in pi over 2 for b. Then ln of cosine 0. So that's going to equal negative ln of, what's the cosine of pi over 2? 0 minus ln of cosine of 0, which is 1. All right, so there's two tricky things here. Natural log of 0 is undefined. So it's really kind of negative infinity, but really it's undefined. And then, of course, it doesn't matter if the natural log of 1 is 0. I'll just remind you that the natural log, or the log of anything, the log base anything of 1 is always 0. But that doesn't really matter because we've got an undefined here. So this one diverges. 
So you can see we just did an awful lot of math to find out that the limit does not exist and that therefore this thing diverges. So what we're really saying here is that sometimes when you take the area and something's shooting off up an asymptote, sometimes that area is finite, other times it's infinite, just depends on the, very, on the subtleties of the shape. And in this case, it turns out that it was infinite. Bummer. All right, this is the last one, last heinous problem in this category. So as soon as you try and integrate this thing, you're gonna get into trouble trying to figure out what the integral is. The temptation would be, hey, you know, why don't we use power rule? Um, but the reason that's not gonna work is because for the power rule to work, your u would be x squared minus four, and therefore a du would be two x dx. It might kind of look like that might work because we do have an x at our disposal. The problem is this re isn't really an x, it's an x downstairs, it's an x to the minus one. So the x we've got is an x to the minus one, not an x to the positive one, like we need for our du. So power rule doesn't work here. It turns out this is actually an inverse secant problem, an arc secant problem. So well, first thing we'll do is rewrite this as a limit problem to get rid of the undefined aspect. The reason this is undefined is because when we plug in two, we'll get two squared is four, minus four is zero downstairs. So this thing is undefined at two. So I have to take the limit as A, because it's a lower limit, it doesn't matter what letter you use. As A approaches two, limit for, uh, integral from A to four of two dx over x. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so it turns out this integral is actually an inverse secant. So we got the limit as A approaches two. Now for the secant, this two is actually we don't need, so we can just move that out front. Our U, if you look at the arc secant formula, it's got a one upstairs, and then it's got a U, and then the square root of U squared minus A squared. So that so that's what's great about the arc secant formula, and that's the reason they actually make you learn these if you're in an AP class is because um, even you can have a u, even though you have an x squared downstairs within the, the power, you know, the square root, your du only has to be a dx because your u is just whatever squared. So u is just x, which means du is just dx. So instead of having this matching problem we had over here where the derivative of x squared well, had an x in it, the secant formula allows us to turn x squared, our u is just x to the first power, and therefore dx. And then of course a is just gonna be whatever number we've got here. So four is a squared, which means that a equals two. All right, so now we're just gonna plug and chug. So we've got a two, and then it's gonna be secant. Oops, I forgot one little thing. So in the in inverse secant problem, it's one over a. And a is two, so that means we've got a one half secant minus one of u over a, so that's x over two. And that is integrated from a to four. All right, still with me? So this two and this one half cancel. So now we got the limit as a approaches two of the inverse secant of four over two, which is two, minus secant minus one of b of a over two. All right, so where a is just this a. Pretty exciting stuff. Of course, that's all limit. All right, so let's go plug it in. This first term doesn't have any a's in it. It's just the inverse secant of two. So what is the inverse secant of two? Uh, right down here. So inverse secant of two is really just the inverse sine of one half, and that is gonna be pi over six. Oops, sorry, cosine. Secant is one over cosine, so that's inverse cosine of one half, which is pi over three. Then we're subtracting 
the inverse secant of a over 2, where a is 1. Sorry, a is 2. So subtract the inverse secant of 2 over 2, which is 1. So what is the inverse secant of 1? Well, that's really the inverse cosine of the reciprocal of 1, which is also 1, which is what angle has an inverse cosine of 1? Has an inverse cosine of 1? 0, because the cosine of 0 is 1. All right, so that means that this is just 0. And we end up with pi over 3. Gnarly enough for you? These are kind of hard to explain. And of course, you can see that, especially these harder ones that have inverse trig functions in them, they're super hard. The limit problem isn't so bad to set up initially, but then sometimes they'll throw really hard integrations into this type of problem. You don't have to worry about inverse uh, trig functions usually unless you're an AP or like a really hard um, college class, but calculus for business majors, calculus for economics and life sciences and stuff, usually, you know, the ones at least I've seen around here are not nearly as hard as far as making you plug and chug through crazy functions. So where this one got really nasty, was that we had to integrate something that went to an inverse secant. Really rare integral to find, but I just wanted to show you how bad these can get. The rest of the time, when it's just a limit problem and kind of a basic integral, like the previous problem we just worked, you know, you'll get through it. Just try and finish the test, you know? And if you have one really nasty integral on a calculus test that's really throwing you off, you, know, you really want to avoid wasting 20 minutes on a problem and getting really flustered, because if you get freaked out and you waste a bunch of time, that can mess up the whole rest of the test when the problem that you, know, you messed up on was actually just a small percentage of the test. So if you come into a problem, you just don't know how to integrate it, and you know it's one of these funky things where you gotta take the limit and all that, you could just skip it and leave it off till the end because these are so hard and so tedious that it's really hard to get them right anyway. And uh, you know, just use your time wisely and realize that in calculus, there's the occasional problem that's just really, really hard, but you can always skip it and save it for later.